Good morning. Welcome to your Friday morning, early morning intuitive guidance. I'm Dr. Bonnie Nussbaum, America's kick-ass coach and psychologist. Man, that's hard to say this morning. Here with some interesting words for today. We are actually going back to our book that we're working our way through, Taking the War Out of Our Words, The Art of Powerful Non-Defensive Communication by Sharon Ellison. And I had figured the universe would give me a break for a couple more days until I was really sure I had a voice back, but nope, it's time for the book again. So those of you who have the book, if you want to dig it out, and those of you who are taking notes and jotting some things down, feel free to grab your notebook and your pen, and we will commence with the next section. Let me grab a drink here. And we'll see how well my voice holds up with this. This is interesting. I think the section we're reading right now is roughly four pages. So hopefully my voice holds in there for that. We will see. Those of you who have the book can read along. Good morning, Mel. Welcome, welcome. Funny, you're showing up on the bottom. There, now the number one showed up. Usually the number shows first and then your name pops up, but this time it was reversed. So, <coughs> excuse me. Still got my good Canada goose imitation going on there. So, welcome to whomever else popped in. Oh, Tom, good morning, good morning. Glad you are here. Um, so, we are, just for those of you who are just joining, because it looks like we have another person who just popped on, um, we are back to taking the war out of our words. So, we'll, our next section starts on 131, page 131, and it's called Function, Laying It All Out on the Table. So, when you think about your communication, how many times do you actually do that? Lay it all out on the table. Good morning, Cindy. Um, most of us hedge our bets. We put part of the story forth and not the whole story. So there's a couple of examples in here of people putting forth the whole story and how that goes for them. So I think this will be a useful part for us to ponder today. What I'd like you to do is just kind of, good morning, Lisa. Glad you're here. Set yourself up to hear this through the wise part of yourself that knows how this information can help you up level in terms of your communication skills and your relationships, especially the ones that maybe are a little difficult and dicey, all right? So page 131 for those of you who have the book and wanna follow along. A card player who shows a hand can lose the game. So the player who wants to win will hide most cards and just put out certain ones when they are called for. Many people live their lives this way, holding back information and playing their cards when they think they can gain the most. Doesn't that already sound like a not very good proposition, huh? I think living this way is a gamble in both the short and long run, and the odds of losing are much higher than the odds of winning. Good morning, Beth. Glad you're here. <coughs> Excuse me. So we are back to the book today. Expressing ourselves through non-defensive Statements is a very different way of living from concealing information as if we were holding back a trump card. With non-defensive statements, we gain power by providing as much information as possible. So here's one example of this. In each of her previous long-term relationships, Debbie felt that the other person had been emotionally withholding and had often pulled back from genuine intimacy with her. Each time she had become insecure, losing her own strength, and feeling increasingly dependent on the other person who subsequently withdrew even more. Good morning, Carolyn. Glad you're here. I was thinking, actually, this section might be really helpful for a couple of you who are talking about relationship issues. So just tune in with that wisdom part of your ear that's going to hear what you need to hear in this. Okay, let's see where I was. At the end of her previous, last previous relationship, she decided... She would never again become so dependent on someone that she would lose her self-esteem. She spent many months learning to feel more secure in her independence. She knew from past experience that she did quite well on her own, but seemed to lose herself when in partnership. How many women can say yes to this? Frequent, frequent, frequent. It's not uncommon at all. She finally met Paula, who did not seem to be emotionally withholding, and with whom she had a wonderful bond. 
At first, Debbie felt proud of her ability to keep her independence, but after a few weeks, she sensed things beginning to shift into the old scenario. One Saturday after they had returned from a trip to the beach, Paula announced, I'm feeling like I need some more space, so I think I'll, I'd like to go home instead of staying until tomorrow. I don't know how to do this, Debbie thought. I see the same old thing happening all over again. Tears came despite her efforts to hold them back. Paula looked very worried and asked her what was wrong. I don't want you to go, was all she could squeak out initially. Well, if you need me to stay, I will, Paula responded. When she heard the words, Debbie knew that if Paula stayed, it would be for her sake, not because Paula wanted to. Finally, Debbie realized that she needed to say it all. She cried freely and she told Paula how each person she had been with had withdrawn. She told her how hard she had worked to not have that happen again and how this relationship seemed different. But recently, she had begun to notice Paula withdrawing more. She even said she thought Paula often seemed to feel the need for space during the times that they were the closest. Debbie concluded, When you decided to go home, I felt an almost unbearable wave of loss and hurt. At the same time, I knew I never again wanted anyone here who didn't want to be. She told Paula she did not feel angry and sincerely preferred that she go home. Debbie said later that she felt great being so clear about not wanting Paula to stay if she wanted to leave. Debbie gave Paula all the relevant information she had. She described how she perceived both Paula's desire to go home and her own reaction to it, which included data from her own life history. She expressed the contradictions. She thought their relationship was different. She saw the same old thing happening. She wanted her to stay. She wanted her to go. Her goal was not to make Paula feel guilty or manipulate her into staying. She gave Paula a multifaceted picture of her state of being with regard to the issue of Paula's leaving in the middle of their weekend together. Paula had enough wisdom to leave without trying to persuade Debbie to let her stay. Good morning, Susan. But something important shifted in that conversation. Paula felt moved by that experience. She did not feel guilty. She felt free to go and anxious to come back. Each of them had remaining work to do with regard to issues such as abandonment and fear of intimacy, and they did it, creating a very strong relationship in the process. Often in this kind of situation, we would not tell both halves of the story, only the half that fit what we wanted the most. If our biggest need was to have the person stay, we might talk about our feelings of abandonment and hope the other person would remain to console us. If we wanted to avoid her feeling pressured to stay, we would keep a stiff upper lip and tell her we wanted her to do what was ever best for her. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Telling both halves the whole story in a non-manipulative way and then expressing what we want most can have a profound effect on both the person making the statement and the person hearing it. Okay? So here's another vignette she shares that captures the essence of what she's talking about, but the, the method is a little bit different, um, and it's another relationship one. Brandon was dating Camille, who would come back to him in between the other men she was dating. He felt used, but couldn't bring himself to say no to her. Sometimes when he was angry, he accused her of just keeping him around for a good time when no one else was around which caused arguments, obviously. Finally, Brandon learned how to tell Camille what he was experiencing in a more open way. The next time she came back, he said directly, I think you came back because you are between boyfriends and you take it for granted that I will be here. And I have been, at least so far, even though I wish I could tell you no, I don't have the strength right now. I partly blame you for it, and I also know that this is my choice. So he gives both sides of the picture, right? <clears throat> Brandon was telling both halves of the story in a situation where his need for Camille, Camille to stay was stronger than his will for her to go, the opposite of what the Debbie situation was that we just talked about. Brandon discovered that his self-esteem had been more damaged 
when he was either silent, pretending Camille had changed her mind and really wanting to be with him, or when he accused and blamed her. Telling the whole story actually made him feel stronger and changed their relationship. He saw Camille more realistically. And she began to feel more respect for him, though her basic pattern did not change. Again, he wasn't manipulating with his words trying to get her to be different than she was. She is who she is who she is. She wasn't invested in making a change to her behavior. Some months later, he was able to make a final break, something he hadn't been sure he would ever do. When it happened, it felt a little bittersweet, but easy. <coughs> When we express ourselves thoroughly without trying to convince the other person to listen to us, we can affect long-lasting changes. So again, just speaking your truth, not worrying about how it's received, not worrying what kind of an outcome you can engineer, just speaking your truth. After a speech I had given, a woman approached me and introduced herself as Raisa. She was a psychologist who had trained in the United States as a young woman, living here for 20 years before returning to her native Orion. When you were speaking, I had a rush of memories, and I'd like to talk to you about them. She told me about a conversation she had had with her brother when she was 10 and he was 9. She described how he used to chase her and hit her and how she would chase him and fight back in response. One day when he was about to hit her, she said to him, I don't like it when you hit me. It's not in my nature. I don't like for you to hit me, and I don't like to hit you. She repeated three, those three sentences to me carefully, softly, and firmly, pausing in between as I imagined she did when she spoke those words as a child. Raisa then said, he never hit me again, not once during the whole time we were growing up. When I heard you today, I realized that I had made a non-defensive statement. I hadn't tried to convince him to agree or threaten him with anything. I just told him how I felt about us hitting each other. Whenever we, try, we add extra force to our words, presenting them as truth, and trying to compel others to agree with us, we usually meet with a great deal of resistance. Good morning, Bonnie. This one was so important for me because I would do that. I would emphasize things I was saying, trying to get it to sink in. Usually this is with my sister Vicky trying to get it so that she could understand where I was coming from. And instantly the reaction I would get is the resistance. And I'm like, um, why is she fighting against this? I'm just saying what I'm thinking. But that wasn't how it was being perceived. So changes needed to occur. It is sometimes hard for us to realize how much effect our words can have when we let them stand on their own, when we let them convey the inherent power of our personal message. A thorough statement <clears throat> excuse me, can become a story within itself that moves others to respond sincerely. The Greek sophist Georgius said that logos, the word with the smallest and most invisible body, accomplishes the most godlike works. It can banish fear and remove grief, instill pleasure and enhance pity. I agree with him. I think we have barely tapped into the true power of our expression because we have stayed tied to the tradition that just prescribes objective statements over subjective statements and persuasion over openness and vulnerability. So when you just say what you need to say, not worrying about the outcome, not mincing your words, picking carefully, trying to maneuver the situation to get what it is that you want the other person to see, when you just speak your truth and then let it go, you have far more success. So she's got a little section here with four questions that are about the mental preparation for doing this kind of work, for making these kinds of statements. Am I willing to speak about my own viewpoint and experience without generally applying it to everyone? So we do that. We bolster our, our position by bringing in other people, by stating it as if it's truth for everybody, instead of saying, I believe, or I feel, or I think, claim it. These are your words. Own them. Second question is, can I express myself without trying to convince anyone else to agree? You're just speaking your truth. If the whole world disagrees with you, it's okay. 
You're still speaking your truth. Number three, can I recognize another person's experience as providing equally important information? And sometimes it's easiest to ask them, can you tell me where you're coming from on this? And then I'd like to be able to tell you where I'm coming from on this. And we don't have to agree. I just want to hear where you're coming from and I'd like to be able to tell you where I'm coming from. Okay. And the fourth one, <coughs> is my statement open, vulnerable, subjective? It's our statement. It's subjective and descriptive, describing what's happening. So going back to these two examples, when Debbie said very directly, I don't want you to go. And then let's see, where's the other part? When you decided to go home, I felt an almost unbearable wave of loss and hurt. At the same time, I knew I never again wanted anyone here who didn't want to be here. Just stating it very flatly. Stating it very flatly. Yes, exactly. Carolyn's talking about when people text things. It's way too open for interpretation. And I've gotten pretty good at when something starts to heat up, I think, via text message saying, I'm going to call you. And again, it's usually my sister. Um, and then we can hear, I'm 99 times out of 100, we are on the same page with it. But how something comes across in a text can be abrupt, can be misinterpreted, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then Brandon being direct with Camille, he said, I think you came back because you are between boyfriends and you take it for granted that I will be here. And I have been, at least so far, even though I wish I could tell you no, I don't have the strength right now. I partly blame you for it, and I also know that it is my choice. So he's putting the whole story out there, right? So guess what I want us to practice today? Putting the whole story out there. Don't just say the half that kind of bolsters your position. Put it all out there, all right? <coughs> it may take some practice for you to even be able to, to articulate what is the whole story here. Um, because we're so used to subconsciously editing out the part we don't want to say. So enjoy some practice today. Take some opportunities. See what you can do. Some of these may come up just organically in your day. Others, you may decide to think it through on your own first and then go pursue it. You know, the other day when we were talking about blah, blah, and I kind of shut down on you, let me tell you where I was coming from. Would that be okay? And put the whole story out there. The whole story. Can't wait to see how this goes. Put some comments in the feed. If you've had some practice with this recently, put it in the feed. Let's see where we go with it. So, made it through without totally hacking up a lung. This is good. Have an awesome day. We'll see you again tomorrow. Remember, you're capable of far more than you think you are. Bye-bye.